Hello. On this episode, we have none other than middleweight UFC superstar, the gorilla, Darren Till. Uh-huh. Thanks for joining me on Polycast, Darren. How are you? No problem, mate. Of course, I'm just trying to get through this lockdown. Uh. <laughs> it's a nightmare, it's isn't it? It's uh-huh. It's one of them, mate. You know what I mean? It's, I don't know how long it's going to last, but... Still got to stay strong, haven't we, mate? You know what I mean? Exactly. Are you able to get in any training? Yeah, well, the, one of the lads that lives down the gym, he's uh, he's got the keys. So just just me and him have been training, and uh, we. I was I was sick like a few weeks ago. I felt I had like a bit of a sickness. I don't know whether it was this stuff or what. But, yeah. And he was before that, so maybe we've both kicked it off now so we've just been saying to me and him every day alone so an hour a day mate just to keep the body you know rolling over so, so what, are you, what are you saying Darn Tell has beat Coronavirus sorry so what are you saying to me Darn Tell has beat the Coronavirus <laughs> I don't know if I've beaten or not but maybe I think just cause I don't know maybe cause I'm younger than that you know yeah. uh, we fight it off pad but Obviously, for the older ones and that, mate, yeah, like true. they won't fight it off as easy. So, I probably just had a cold, a sickness, or whatever, but I felt great since then. And maybe it was just maybe we're probably all gonna get it, but some of yeah. us are just gonna react differently. That's I'm just here. my theory, mate. I don't want to get like mad on theories and conspiracies, it's not my thing, really, but that's just how I'm looking at it. Yeah, so Darn, before we actually go into it, uh. I heard that you were a really good, great player for Peacock football team. Yeah, Danny tell you that. A great Danny left back. Yeah, oh. yeah. Did, I, did Danny, Danny Vaughan tell you that? Yeah. Ah, said all names. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> mate. Yeah. I, was a, I was a right back for Peacock. And then I, before like, I stopped playing footy to fight, I was, a, I was in right midfield. So I finished like my career, as you want to say. Yeah. In, right midfield so I was like I was only like 13 when I stopped me but I'd played footy like since I was a baby so it was like a choice between because I was getting good at the fighting and I, you know I, I was I was a decent pretty decent footy player so it was a choice but like I, I don't know maybe I was just going towards the fighting in the end like when I was 30 I was, just, I was more interested than fighting than playing footy yeah, well, in fairness, I think it was pretty evident from the stories that I heard because I don't think you played much games for Peacock because you were always getting sent off. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I was I was fighting a lot, like yeah, there was it was quite a rough league to be fair. <laughs> uh, like <laughs> I just remember every game was tough, mate, and I was a big right back and I remembered There'd be a few scraps and that, yeah. like, but uh, mate, I wasn't bad, I swear. I was a good footy player. Well, I heard but... we're very good in fairness now. Yeah. But I'm sure the fighting there probably helped you get started in MMA. Yeah, well, no, at first, Pad, right? I went to the boxing gym. I, I, like, I went to the boxing gym first and, uh, like, just did a few bags and that, just not on, not on too serious. And then I went on to the Muay Thai gym. And then I stayed in that for a few years and, and then I got into the MMA later. But it was good because I'd already established a striking background. Yeah. So I'd had a few boxing fights. I don't don't done all right in the hard box. Even a few lads said to me, they said, Oh, you should stick with the boxing, like try and go pro and that. And I was like, Oh, I'm more interested in like MMA and that. And uh, so that was that me, but at least when I went to MMA, I wasn't just that because the thing is for anyone is listening who doesn't know is when you go into MMA I think it's good to have a background so for example yeah. me or you you've got a strike and boxing background you'd be a lot easier to work with strategy wise same yeah. for me whereas some people who just go straight into MMA they learn a bit of everything so they're sort of good in every area whereas if you went into MMA and I just worked with you, wrestling, const, constant wrestling. You'd just be knocking guys out with your boxing yeah. with the small four-ounce gloves. And 
you'd be like getting better in maybe one or two other areas where you need to be because you're such a good boxer. Same for me. I needed to be have great wrestling defense so I could strike with people, kick and whatever. Whereas yeah. just MMA, you're just getting a bit of 50-50s from everywhere. You're not really excelling in one kind of martial art. So... Um... That's interesting to hear that, though, that you actually did box before. Yeah. What was the name of the club? Can you remember? No, it was it was unlicensed fight oh. club. So, yeah, <laughs> at the time. Well, I, I actually did a few uh, classes at the Rotunda, you know, where the yeah. snitch are from. I, I, like, that was, I was like, oh, I was a baby. And then I'd done, like, karate class and that. But there was, it was just a boxing gym, uh, City Road round the corner from where we live. It wasn't like an amateur. Yeah. It was just where a few of the lads go. And then when I was like getting into the Muay Thai, I, I needed a bit of money. And there was always done licensed fights everywhere. And then it was, I think it was some guy who was something to do with Amir Khan at the time or someone like that. I boxed one of their fighters in an unlicensed fight and he was a former ABA, like, what champion, I don't know what he was, and, and I beat him. Uh, and they were saying to me, like, oh, you should, like, come boxing and that, and, you know, uh, you, you're good, you, you could be, like, a good boxer and that, and a good pro and that. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll see about the offer and that, but I, I just wasn't interested, mate, to be honest. I was just pure, like, MMA at the time. Maybe, maybe it would have done, maybe, I don't know what road I could have went down, you know what I mean? Like, I know I've always been quite a, a decent decent boxer. I've always had good head movements and, and stuff and good fakes. So, you know, you don't know. But it set me up good for the MMA. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm pleased with. Boxing, boxing probably give you a foundation. Yeah. Um, so, you've obviously incorporated in your stay, which is fire. Exactly. Yeah. So, I've went into MMA with a strong foundation, as you say. Yeah. With the good kicks and the good elbows and good, like good boxing with the small gloves, you know what I mean. So it's done me well. So, so Don, tell us like a bit your sporting journey for for people who may have been living under a rock, who may not know you, um, like from your beginning to like basically where you are now. How did you achieve certain goals, and how did you get to from starting off to where you are now? Well, at the at the time when I first started. It was not like I just wanted to be like sort of the best in the gym. I wanted to like didn't want to get beat ever in sparring and stuff. And then as time went on and I wasn't doing so well in school and that I wasn't say like I was a bad kid. I just wasn't interested in school. Most of us were probably the same. <laughs> so I, my mum was like making me make a choice at the time. She was like, you know, you 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 need to make a choice what you want to do. Then and I was like, I just want to fight, mum. I didn't think about, like, I wanted to fight for money or not, and I just thought, mm -hmm. I can make a good go out of this. I was, you know, one of the best in the gym at the time and that. So then I started really getting into it. I turned pro very young, and I just started beating beating guys from all over the world. I was travelling to Canada. I was travelling to Thailand. I was just beating everyone. And then <clears throat> I'd made a little bit of money, but not nowhere near enough to, like, survive yeah. or live. And then that's when... I was like about 17. I got into the MMA and messaged Terry Etam from over in where I am now, Carlborn. And like I once, I started doing private lessons with him and that. And then that's when I started going to the actual classes. And then I had, because I had such a like, decent striking background, I had a few amateurs. And then my coach was sort of talking about going pro. And then... Obviously, you know, it is part in the streets and that. I got stabbed in, in 2000. And it was like August 2012. And like, my coach was like, oh, you just, you're not concentrating fully on your career. You, you, you're out, you know, you're getting into trouble all the time. You're mixing with the wrong people. You're doing, yeah. you know, the wrong things. He's like, if you want to make a go at this, he's like, I can make that happen. He's like, but you need to trust me and, and go somewhere else and just get your head down for a few years. And you'll be sound. I said, oh, all right, coach. Like, you know, I believe in you and I trust you. What do you think's best for me? And he was like, go to Brazil. Go over there and learn the art of, like, the ground game and that over there. Stay there for a few years for me, son. 
and trust me, you, you know, you'll make a good go out of it. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll do it. So, like, a few weeks later, on from that, this was, like, the end of 2012 now. i never forget, because it was around my birthday. I went to Brazil, and I got there, and I didn't know a soul, and I was like, ah, oh, I didn't speak the language. It was a bit fucking... It was a bit mad, to be fair, mate. And then I got myself settled in a little, uh, little apartment, and the coach just said, listen, twice a day, get here at 10 in the morning. It's a 15, 20-minute walk for you on the beach. You sound... And let's see what's happening with you. Let's see what we can yeah. do with you. I said, okay, then. So, mate, I just fucking... That's all I did, did when I was there then. I just lived... I just lived, ate, breathed it, everything, mate. It was just my life. And then I turned pro, and I started having pro fights all over Brazil. And I mean, mate, it's a massive place. I was traveling to and from on buses. Or what. I didn't give a fuck. I just wanted to fight. And then, long story short... The number one guy at the time in Brazil, got a, his name was Wendell, got a contract to go for the UFC. And I was sort of in the rankings at that point. And then I, I, I got a fight, offered a fight to fight. And if I win that fight, I, I, I'd get in the UFC. Won the fight, got in the UFC. And then I was scheduled to face the number one, the former like, number one of Brazil. And, and I beat him in the first round, mate. So... I sort, of I sort of considered myself the number one in Brazil before I'd left. And then my second fight was in the UFC there, but I was still living in Brazil. That was, that was scheduled for Dublin, the three arena, yeah? Yeah. So I had that fight that was in, that was on the 24th of October, 2015. So you're talking five years ago. Yeah. Co-main event, or just one before the co-main, we had a fight of the night. My shoulder popped out in the fight, but I, I still survived. We got a draw fight tonight. It was, I think it was top 10 fights of the year. So got a good bit of money for that going back to Brazil. And then my coach was sort of like, come back home, Darren. Now let's go for the, the big time. Let's, yeah. let's get you all them little details. Let's work on all that. And, you know, so the story goes. So I came back in 2017, the end of 2016. I had two fights again in the UFC, won both of them. And that's when they put me in to fight with uh, Donald Cerrone, Cowboy Cerrone. Yeah. And then from there, mate, it was all she wrote. You know, I, I beat him, I, no I knocked him out in the first round and went on to fight Stephen Thompson in the Echo Arena. Th this is the, the time when I'd signed with MTK. We're both for MTK now. And then I sold that out to the Echo Arena and then they gave me the title shot. And then from there, it was sort of like, what I'd never experienced, my little downfall in, in you know, in the fight game, I, I lost the, to the champion and then I lost my fight after that. And now we're sat here, I'm, I'm a middleweight now, I've gone up a weight and I've just beat the, the, the former number one. So, see, that's see, it. Your, your three defeats, speak to me about them because from my understanding, like, you probably tell GP anyway, but you were, a, you were a big, big welterweight. Do you think the weight making played a massive part in your performance? Yeah, I, I don't like to say it. I, I'll, I'm not one of them, Pad. I won't come well, out. Well, it's not an excuse, but it's, it's yeah, as a factor I know. But if I, if I talk analytically, like, I think that the way I was going on to, to, to the, towards the end of my welterweight career, it, it, it didn't become about fighting no more. It became about me walking around constantly drained and, and, and mal, malnourished. I, I didn't have the right nutrition. I did. I was eating the right, but it wasn't for the type of size of guy I am. I'm six foot one, six foot two, like 210, 220 pounds, mate. Like, I'm a big fucking dude. There's no, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. for me to then try and lose 40 plus pounds, it just wasn't healthy for the body. Yeah. And it definitely definitely wasn't healthy for the brain like the, the amount of water I must have been losing so whereas I could take shots in the gym from heavyweights and whatever a smaller guy like Masvidal who was a lightweight before moved up to welterweight was knocking me out like that shouldn't happen to, yeah. I, I'd never ever been rocked or anything and then fair play to him mate what it, the, the technique he'd done and that but the slip off it was lovely it was beautiful but I have to put part of the blame down to 
what I was putting my body through stress related to make the weight like 40 plus pounds even the week of the fight I'm losing 25 pounds 25 plus pounds and it's physically and mentally more mentally draining the life out of me where I couldn't even fight it I wasn't in no shape to fight would you say the the weight making issues would be like a, a pit of your career you know and also, did you have any traces at the time helping you? Yeah, it's, it, I, I did for, for my last few fights because the weight got so hard. Yeah. I had to have a nutritionist counting calories and counting yeah. what goes inside me. So, yeah, I did. He, he was perfect as well. He like, knew exactly what he was doing, how much to give me and that. But you're talking, I was training two hours in the morning, two at night. And like I'm not being able to eat like much food. It's like little bowls of salad and that. As I said to you, Pad, I'm six foot one, six foot two, nearly two hundred and twenty pounds, something like that. Eating that, it's just no good for training, no good for the mind. So although he was getting me close to the weight and I was making the weight, and it was it was just affecting me. It was there yeah. was there was no life fighting at that weight and. I had two losses, which I, I'm going to put 50% down to the, the opponent just being simply better than me on the night. Yeah. But to the weight cuts, there was no other way. To, do you know what I mean? What, what would be like your, your, your career best performance or the highlight of your career? Something which stands out? Do you know what? Not a lot of people might have seen this, Pat. They've only seen a lot of because the UFC is more, it's bigger. But in 2014, in I think it was the, I think it was the fourteenth of December, right in Brazil. My coach, I said to me coach, right, I've been running through these guys in Brazil. I said I want a tough, tough test to see if I've got what it takes. Like yeah. I, I'm beating these guys, they're good, but I don't feel like they're good enough, you know. And uh, he said to me, okay, sound. There's a guy out in Argentina. He's like the number one over there. He's Cuban. He's he's fucking massive for the weight. He's strong and he's a wrestler. He, he used to f he fought in the Olympics. I was like, okay, that's the guy. Then yeah. he was like, Darren, but trust me, this guy is like, this is not gonna be a tough test for you. This is, you know, you're going in there. The, the, you 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 might lose, mate. You know, yeah. basically just saying that. I was like, okay, we'll see. So gave me like two to three months of training. I just trained with our wrestling coach every day, just literally tactically. To beat this guy, you know the fights on YouTube. If anyone wants to watch it, it's Darren Till versus Guillermo Martinez. So Guillermo normally spelt like Guillermo Martinez, and I beat him unanimously, mate. He didn't take me down once. I just kept kicking, me and him moving off with the left hand. And uh, you know what makes me proud of victory up today because yeah. I'm not. I, I remember how tough the fight was, and and it was against a hostile crowd. We're all. Like Argentinians are quite mad as well, and uh, I just remember, mate, of watching all his fight videos. He was just, he was just battering these guys. He was a really strong dude. So beating him at that point, mate, that's probably I've always said that's my most favourite moment in my career. Like it's stuff like that there fighting early in your career and like out of your comfort zone in the hostile environments. Yeah, he really stands to you. Uh, tell me this. In boxing, you know, Mexico would have like a a fighting attack attacking fighting style. Like you were based in Brazil for like was it five years? Yeah, four, yeah, four years. Or, um, did they have like their own unique style? And did you were you able like when you come home to bring it back with you? Uh, yeah, well as I say, mate, the ground game, the jujitsu and all yeah. that, that was born in Brazil, but fighting style you could compare them to Me Mexicans, maybe not as technical, like, yeah. they've just, they've got an iron chin, and they, they just, deal brawl, like, Mexicans still got the technique, like, they, they'll go in there to brawl, to get you to the ground, to then submit you, but it's not like, really, technical, as to say, yeah. it's a lot of swinging, and diving, and, you know, a lot of that, but tough, tough, what I found in Brazil, a lot is, I, I don't know who this works for, but 
the Brazilians really have a strong belief in like religion. So it's mad the belief that I've seen that they had over there is because they believe that God is going to carry them to the victory. And I think that's so much so powerful because they're just putting all their faith into one man's hands. Yeah. And it's taken their belief system because of it, because of their religion, is phenomenal. Here, where, where, um, where is your camp uh, based now? In Liverpool. So I have, I've only been back to Brazil to see the boys, see I got a daughter over there. That's I have only been back for that since I left. So I'm just based in Liverpool now. So see while you were training in Brazil, like did you get homesick? Um, yeah, back home yeah of, course, of course. How did you did you deal with that? Uh, I, I I don't know, mate. I just I knew that I wasn't going to be there for life, but I just I think because I had me attention on other things like I had my daughter over there and that as well I just think that I knew that there was a bigger picture than me being a little bit sad about home I missed some some types of the training I, I missed the training and that with me coach back here in Liverpool yeah. but you know I, I sort of did make it home over there for me not the same but I did try as much as I could and, and, and I made a good you know group of friends which is always yeah. good to have you know, when, mate, I was just training three times a day over there, like, three times a day, like, fighting as much as I could. Like, I think I had, like, 14 or 15 fights out there, and that's all I was doing, mate, just fighting as much that's as I could. That's class. I heard you were sparring with some Irish fighters, like, namely, Kane McClurton. Um, yeah, yeah, he come, he come to Liverpool to, to spar with me. That big fucker. Yeah, he's massive. <laughs> how do you find them? How do you think that, that, that they will get on in their careers? I think good. Yeah, Kyle's a, he's a big guy. He's, I didn't. I thought he was a light heavyweight when he come yeah. to to spar. He, he's a middleweight like me. He's bigger than me, but uh, tough. I mean, I threw some bombs at him and he took them <laughs> and uh, threw some of himself back. So yeah, I, th- I think if he if he puts us all into it, mate, he's got a good coach and good camp. I think yeah, and he's always more than welcome to. To pop over to us, mate. It's only thirty minutes, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> on exactly. the plane. Well, tell me, this, you're uh, scheduled to fight on the fifteenth yeah. of August against the number one contender. Yeah, in your <laughs> land. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I'll definitely be here watching you. Um, yeah, yeah. And I went there. You know, he's number one. I went there. You should take his place. Yeah. Uh, to fight him on uh, Israel. So yeah. Uh, I seen you had a bit of beef with Israel on Twitter. Yeah. How, how, do they, how do you take that? Oh, it's, it's just one of them, innit? I don't like, <laughs> I don't know how the beefs in, in boxing are as, um, as much. I know that you he's, he's, he's talk a lot of shit, but it's just the same thing. Like, you know, uh, I think we're just building it, mate. You know, uh, he, he's, he's actually, you know, like, guy, I think he's like, he's yeah. a nice guy, but, you know, we're going to fight. Do you think? If I get past the number one. Do you think the fight will happen this year, even taking into consideration the, the coronavirus? Uh, yeah, well, obviously, Pad, I don't know what's happening with this coronavirus. As I said, I'm not like really into yeah. big theories and conspiracies, whatever's going to happen. But if I fight in Dublin in uh, August 15th and I come out unscathed, a, a bit, you know, hopefully I beat where to hell and no one would have beat him. What a good Zafari Confederate, he's number one in the division. Number so, one, he was the yeah. champion. He beat, he, you know, he defended his belt a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Him. Cannot look past him. Okay. And I know he doesn't look past me, so. It's all down to that, but you know, if 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 it goes my way and I get past them, mate, December the, the UFC always do their biggest card in December, their biggest pay per view in Vegas. That that could be, that could be me and me and Israel, yeah. you know. But yeah. as I said, mate, I can't even think about it because of the person I'm fighting next. We're taking the former champ. I've got to, yeah. I've got to solidify my number one spot. So what what is your main goal, though? Like. Obviously, you're in lane now. Your your visits on Whitaker and obviously longer term Israel. Like, what is your main goal? Like to be like the champ. Obviously, the champ. But yeah, I, 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 I want to be the champ, mate. But I want to just be considered all time. This is as yeah. like maybe top five best ever to do it. So like, you know, in boxing the way they have like best ever's top ten. I would. I just want to be top five. 
top five best of all time with the types of names I get mentioned with. Yeah. That's yeah. enough for me. So I've got, you know, I'm 27. I've got probably another nine years, eight years to go. I, I definitely believe I can do it. Top five best of all time to do it, mate. That's that's what I really want. So the belts and that are all important, but that is Legacy. why I, I started out. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna ask you a bit some some more serious stuff. Uh what what about your beef with uh Jesse Lingard? Now I didn't know about this here until about thirty minutes ago where I seen him writing on Twitter calling you out saying you're not having a shape bag. He did? Word of God, yeah. Just seen Twitter 30 minutes ago. Oh my God, the cheeky bastard. Oh. So you make it on him, darn. Oh, going to have to put it on that one tonight. Yeah. Do you know what, mate? It's not even a beef, it's just me rambling shit. I, I, I think even... have to hear, he says, uh, hold on, you're a shape bag and he will smash you up. <laughs> you're having me on. I'm not even, Dorn. I, I haven't never yet. I don't think I'll. <laughs> not a chance. Will, you know what, mate? If he has. <laughs> Fuck him anyway. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what, mate? Just me rambling shit. I'm, I've got no room for him. Brilliant. But here, uh, tell me this. What would happen if you were left in a room alone with Piers Morgan? <laughs> Fucking hell, mate. He'd probably get me done for a sort of book to give him one on the chain, like, or I don't know, I'd probably just fucking hail abuse at him. <laughs> Can't <laughs> stand the cunt. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I that, It's just it's fucking, ah, oh, mate, it just it gets under my skin. I don't hate the man. Yeah. But just fucking talks absolutely. He's one of the guys who you love the hit. You just love the hit. Yeah, I do. I love to hate It's like, Obviously, if he ever asked me to go on a show, I'd go on and I'd have a, yeah. a beef for him. But I don't hate the man. I just he, it's easy to hate hate what he's about. It's just yeah. it's weird, mate. He's got too much to say about everything. Yeah, that's true. I think scouts just don't like him from years ago because of the Hillsborough and stuff and yeah, that. But it's it's not even that, mate. It's just nowadays what I see what he talks about is just he's, he's a very knowledgeable guy. He knows more than yeah. me, mate. But just chat shite about everything. Well, Don, before we end this here, I'm going to ask uh, a quick fire round. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Okay? okay, let's do it. First one is, if you could choose another sport, what would it be? <sighs> tennis. Tennis? Yeah, I've always wanted to have a good game with tennis. I'm no good at it, but love to be able to play the game. You know what? You actually look like Andy Murray, so if you're good at it. <laughs> <She's a bastard. laughs> uh, who is your greatest rival? Israel. Israel, yeah. yeah. Good job. Um, do you have any pre fake superstitions? Uh, no, but I like to uh, pull my shorts up. I always like my legs to be like free for kicking, so. Yeah. I'll always yeah. make sure, like, four or five times each short, I'll, like, pull them up and pull them down just to make sure the... Like, I always do that without a doubt. It's, like, programmed yeah. inside yeah. of me. Uh, Favourite quote? I, I don't have one. No, no. No, no, no. Favourite sports person, past or present? Probably Muhammad Ali. Brilliant. Brilliant. Gotta be. Now, this is a serious question now. Go on. I already know the answer, but Everton or Liverpool? Liverpool. What? Liverpool. I thought you were a blue. I'm a blue. Oh, it's a Danny Vaughan. A, I'm a fucking red. No I'm way. A I'm a red. <laughs> oh, does he know the answer? He's been telling you shite oh, about no. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, here, Darn. Listen. Class. Them on. It was nice great. one, Pad. And big big shout out, right? Big shout out to all the people watching and big shout out to all the guys going to Free Arena in August if we get past this shit. Yeah. 100%. 100%. And good over there. And I'll see you there. Thanks, mate. See you later, Pad. Yeah. Ta-da, mate.